My name is Nathan Bales, and the piece you're about to hear is titled It's Coming for Solo Timpani. So why did I write for Solo Timpani? Well, that's because it's freaking awesome. I love timpani. Timpani is really, really cool. I think it's such a fascinating instrument. And the genre is just so capable of so much exciting things. And some composers might say that it's because of the timpani's limitations that make it creatively exciting because you have to come up with more unique ideas. But uh, no, that is not what I think. I think that it is an endless source of music. There's so much left to be done with the timpani that hasn't been done that makes it so much fun to write for. In particular, I think its capability for melody is really, really amazing because it can display melodies in this haunting, gorgeous sound that is so unique to just the timpani. Um, and, you know, this piece was sort of my exploration of things that I would love to see out of the timpani. And, um, you know, it's, it's my maiden voyage out to Timpani Isle. And I hope that you enjoy what I saw there as much as I did.
Hello, my name is Alastair Coleman. I'm a first year student at Curtis and the composer of the next piece titled Scenes from Snow's Alley, which is written for solo organ. This piece recounts scenes from my first experiences with music as a chorister at St. Paul's K Street in Washington, DC. The church is nestled in this kind of quasi maze of roads and alleys lined with brick and enclosed with these colorful little residences. Uh, in DC, this place is known as Snow's Alley or Snow's Court, and we used to commute through it every week for many rehearsals uh, and services. This piece really captures my childhood connection to that place uh, and to the many people, events, and memories, uh, both good and bad, uh, that punctuated many stages of my childhood. That church was also the first place I encountered the organ. Now, I used to love noodling around on the instrument, you know, even though my feet couldn't even reach the pedals. Um, but whenever I think of the organ, I, I think of that place. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the kind of power and, and grandeur of the instrument, especially in the context of a church's reflective and, and sometimes gothic space. So with that, I want to say a huge thank you to organist Aaron Patterson for his incredible work in bringing this piece together, um, and also to the composition faculty uh, for their amazing guidance on the piece. Hope you enjoy.
Last September, the journal Nature Astronomy published a paper authored by a team of scientists from around the world entitled Phosphine in the Cloud Decks of Venus. Since its publication, an error in the data set has come to light that might preclude the conclusions of the article, but the basic assertion was that the presence of phosphine potentially detected in the atmosphere of the second planet from the sun could possibly be an indication of organic matter, the building blocks of fundamental life. What does it take to make an afterlife? As much as it takes to make life itself, 13 billion years and a little bit of oxygen, hydrogen, and plasma? Or was David Bowie right when he wrote that the film is a saddening bore because she's lived it 10 times or more? This piece asks, what is the sound of deep space in the innards of a cell, the edges of reality in the spark of a quark? How can we be so rare and so insignificant at the same time? Something's got to give. Well, I personally believe the rarity is the more likely lie. As Toni Morrison said, we die. That may be the meaning of life, but we do language. That may be the measure of our lives. Tracing the edges of phosphine readings as, the, as if it were Kandinsky. Listening for a song in radio waves emitted by long dead entities thousands of years ago, asserting the self in the void. This piece essentially works as an improvisation live process through techniques suggested by the graphic score, which uses the phosphine spectrograms as visual art by which sound is derived. Marcus and I worked together to devise a scheme for the piece, methods of reading the graphs framed by pitches from a fragmented transcription of the eponymous Bowie song. And he deserves as much credit as I do for bringing the piece to life. I guess now the only thing left to do is wait 13 billion years and see what happens.
Hi, my name is Elise, and I'm the composer of the piece Made from Broken Mockingbirds. This piece is an illustration of the tendency of solitude to evoke a re-remembering or a re-understanding of the past. Uh, while in the last piece in this series, the room acted as a conversational counterpart, in this piece, uh, the room acts as an echo chamber. It amplifies and twists the thoughts of a person obsessing over their memories. Um, the text that the Murmurists will be speaking was written by me, inspired by Gertrude Stein, and is also a rumination on uh, the fickleness of memory, particularly when it pertains to a person. And the electronic part is entirely sampled from a music box in my room that plays the song Unforgettable by Nat King Cole. And also I just want to say thank you so much to Hamza for all this hard work and as always to uh, my teachers for helping me along the way. Taste it. Feel it sweet and then sharpen your tongue. And taste the sweet and sharp together on the tip of your tongue. Touching the roof of the sharp taste of the sweet tip tongue And how he slides down the sharp and sharp To make everything sweet In your stomach Until, of course, there is acid, and he will be sweet and sharp, but of course, burn, as a matter of course, but was the tart acid? Already in your mouth before your stomach.
course that was of course taken by the course sweet course sugar this salt and sour trace back to the opening of your lips and what was done there was neither acidic nor bitter but was burning of course so with sweet citrus and fresh sharpness He would be, of course, both sweet and sharp and burn your tongue because sharp, souring and tart became too much and tired too often of sweetness. Of course, he would be bitter, laced with sugar, the coarse sugar that, of course, was dissolved. So the dissolution of the disillusion became the burning question sharp on the tongue and easily sweetly sliding into the acid that was already there. There. Acid. Acid. There in the mouth of sharp, burning, sweet, and into the tongue. Taste too much. It bitter easily. Still. Still. Course of course, sliding down in the dissolved stomach, easily and sweetly, still sharp, tart, bitter, dissolution of the matter, already opening, empty sliding lips, feel down the burn, bitter sugar in the mouth, together both, acid, tired of the feel it, neither matter, the course, of course, the course, course, sugar on the second course you're burning trace down the acid sharp laced sugar there tired of the tired of the tired of sugar disillusion still feel it done tired still tired of the two much too fresh much too coarse trace back question burning neither matter neither matter of the sharpened, sweetened, acid, sweetened, acid, sharpened, sugar, bitter, sugar, bitter, everything, everything, everything still in it. So was he acid. Feel for stomach. On the tongue tip. 
and in the pucker of your lips or was that of course just the lemonade Hello, I'm Elizabeth Yunan and I'm in my third and final year at Curtis. You're about to hear Emma Mine Renkin premiere my Fantasia No. 4 for solo violin, a continuation of the suite of Fantasias I'm writing for different solo instruments. My music is rarely programmatic, that is, it doesn't usually draw upon a story or a narrative, that is not to say, however, that one can't create a story from my music, although I normally look towards contrasts in emotion, texture, tone colour, and so on. That remains the case today. However, this piece was partly inspired by the energy created by the wonderful sentence structures in the books and plays that we read in our liberal arts class at Curtis. The long, beautiful, flowing lines of Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, which seem to increase with urgency as the sunny day in June progresses. The halting, abrupt, jolting phrases and dry, ironic humour of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. The curiously, yet somewhat aptly titled, The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas by Gertrude Stein. And although this piece is notated exactly and precisely, Emma is of course free to imbue the work with subtle yet powerful nuances, which, like speech, can be manipulated to create different interpretations. My immense gratitude to Emma. Thank you. 